Most people know that the Michael Myers mask was a repurposed William Shatner mask altered into the nightmares of people all over the world. Most don't know that the man responsible for that is Tommy Lee Wallace. Wallace was integral to the making of Halloween and has been involved behind the scenes of the career of John Carpenter, along with making his own mark with directing, for example, with the film Fright Night Part 2, writing with the story for Amityville 2 The Possession, and even some acting by being one of the few crew members to stand in for The Shape in Halloween. Wallace has been a big part of genre entertainment since that fateful Halloween night and still is to this day. Though he has a very extensive history in film and television, Tommy is probably most well known for writing and directing Halloween 3 and the Stephen King TV miniseries of It. So it is my great pleasure to welcome to Midnight's Edge the man behind the mask, Tommy Lee Wallace. Director, writer, and sometimes actor, correct? <laughs> Reluctantly, yeah. <laughs> but we want, really want to thank you for your time today. We know you don't have a lot, so we're going to get right into it. Tell us a little bit about your background, like where you came from, when you decided you wanted to get into film, and how that all came about. I grew up in a small town in Kentucky, southern Kentucky, Bowling Green. Uh, same hometown as John Carpenter, incidentally. And uh, we grew up knowing each other and became very close friends in high school. And uh, I, I went on to art school in Ohio, and uh, John headed out west, and then we kept corresponding by letters, and the California, Los Angeles, uh, in John's letters started sounding more and more exciting all the time. So when I graduated from college as a designer, my fork in the road was either New York or Los Angeles, and having an ally and friend already out there, I decided to go to uh, USC Film School and pursue what was being touted as the art form of the century. So uh, that's how I got to California. The University of Southern California is kind of a feeder school into the movie business. And so we, we were learning from and meeting lots of sort of Hollywood luminaries who would give their time, come down, tell us war stories about uh, the movie business and, uh, you know, shed light on the uh, on how it's done in the uh, conventional way, in the, the Hollywood way. And uh, John was very ambitious and very, very directed in his thinking. He'd know what he wanted to do since he was about nine years old. Film directing was something that was new to me. I didn't know there was such a, such a thing. But I started it out since I had a good, strong portfolio and graphic design, I started out in the animation department at USC, but I soon was lured into live action filmmaking. It was just so exciting and so much fun and made several friends. Spent a lot of my time up at uh, John's place with a couple of other friends who were uh, movie movie people. So it was, and it seemed like everywhere you turned, uh, like the first place apartment I lived in uh, near USC, I woke up one day and there was a movie production next door. Uh, all these crazy looking props were out on the lawn and it was tremendously exciting. I think the first thing that attracted me was the people working didn't look all straight and stayed. They looked all like hippies and that's what I looked like. And so uh, I was drawn into what appeared to be a very familiar environment people being creative uh, and you didn't have to wear a suit and tie. Uh, I was soon pulled in as an extra, so I got to sit on set. So this movie is, is the baby by Ted Post, the director. <laughs> I, a fairly forgettable movie, but I was thrilled. I was suddenly thrust into the middle of it, allowed to be uh, an extra playing guitar in the background. And I was getting to watch close up how a movie set worked all pro 35 millimeter just like the grown-ups use and uh so you could say that i was deeply seduced by all that and watched as others george lucas was a re recent graduate of usc and watched as they were going out into the world and making their mark and every time john uh had a, a show of some sort he would turn to me to help him you know bring it off and so that was my avenue into the business I, it was all happening at once. John was uh, was kind of leaving USC as I was entering. Right. And he and Dan O'Bannon were taking their student film, Dark Star, and turning it into a feature thanks to a, an outside 
source of revenue that helped him do that. But the way the film was getting made was very much student style on the weekends with scotch tape and chewing gum and <laughs> out of the trunks of our cars, but still getting made. But that certainly was a high contrast to the organized kind of filmmaking I'd already witnessed mm. by chance next, next door. So all of that uh, got stirred up together into a real interest in and passion for uh, live action filmmaking. Let's talk a little bit about Halloween now. And I am a huge fan of Halloween as well. And obviously you were there from the beginning of the first film. Is there any memories of the film, good or bad, that stick out to you? Well, my memory of the film is twofold. One, it was just a crazy, difficult amount of hard work. When you have a production that is underfunded, but is very ambitious, Right. You guys had what? I believe it was 300000 but it felt like it was a dollar ninety-eight. I mean, remember, too, that John was very smart and very demanding of the, the key elements of the show. He insisted on the best equipment around, which was uh, anamorphic Panavision. That's the widescreen. Right, and it helps. It makes three hundred thousand dollar production look like a three million or thirty million in some cases. Precisely, that was number one. Number two, he insisted on MGM Labs, which was at that time the best in town. And number three, he insisted on post production at uh, Goldwyn Sound, which at that time was the best around. Well, those just don't go with a $300,000 production. So we were in the hole right away because a, a lot of the budget was going to those three categories. So I don't know, really, you could break it down money-wise, but we ended up really on a shoestring. And everybody was doing more than one job. I feel like I was doing about 10 jobs. Uh, so that's one part of my memories. The other part is that our core group we're all friends. We all cared about each other. And we socialized together and uh, we respected John. John was really ready for this. He was a good leader. He was uh, amiable on set, not uptight. He was well, well prepared. And so it was a family production that really buoyed the whole experience because we were all there pulling for each other. Uh, a tight little family unit. Uh, Jamie Lee was brand new to the movie business. Well, she wasn't brand new. She'd been around, but and she'd grown up around it. But this was this was a big break for her, and yet she was a real Girl Scout. She would carry camera cases. You know, uh, she was just one of the group, and that's the way the whole thing was. So really, really hard work, but really fond family memories. That led to a second film a couple years down the road. And famously, you were offered the chance to direct it, right? Well, I was actually on it as director for a fairly for a short while. It's like this. I was the logical heir to the director's chair if Deborah didn't want it, Deborah Hill. Right. And Deborah didn't, I don't know, she didn't feel prepared or it wasn't her cup of tea or whatever, but she didn't want to do it. John was not going to direct the sequel to his own movie. And so the the next choice, logical choice, was me. I was more than ready for directing. I'd been through film school and I'd done some directing of my own. So it, I was a good, solid choice for that, cause, especially because being in the cutting room, I knew John's style. I knew what was required of the job. So the stage was set. Unfortunately, you've got to get back to the context of the time. Tom, there were not all that many sequels going on at that time. Right. Not like it is now. And frankly, all of us kind of shrugged our shoulders when the idea came down as a sequel to Halloween. What? Are you kidding? We made a great movie. Why would we want to go back to that? I mean, we were really naive, but we were also kind of pure. That was, Halloween was a groundbreaking movie, and it was, who could have known it was going to be the phenomenon it turned into? But we did know we'd made a good movie, so it was no surprise that it was popular. And we were all kind of flabbergasted that 
that there was going to be this sequel. And I think that John and Deborah were actually kind of reluctant to do it, but it was also clear that that train was leaving the station, whether they were on it or not. John and Deborah, you know, went off, and I think John largely wrote the sequel. I don't think Deborah had all that much to do with the writing. So had the idea for anthologies come up yet at all? Not at that point. John, uh, you know, it's all good. We're going to be a team. The team's going to do this again. It's going to be great. And uh, so then John turned in this script, and I was so dismayed when I read it. I hated the script for Halloween 2. How did John take it when you told him you weren't on board? Well, I, I, I have never actually discussed it personally with him, but if you want my deepest suspicion, I imagine he hated it too. Yeah, it doesn't sound like he's too happy with it. It, it was the antithesis of the original Halloween. This is the, the problem is that time had gone by and a lot of imitators had popped up in the wake of Halloween, most notably Friday the 13th. And in all of them, the violence got more and more graphic. It, it just, I mean, I don't think Halloween by itself would have engendered the phrase slasher movie. It That came because of all the imitators. So now you got John, who is a very astute observer of the marketplace. And so Halloween 2 is not following on the heels of Halloween. It's, what, two years later or something. And a lot has happened. And I think John went into it understanding that he probably wouldn't be able to maintain sort of the light and shadow and class of the original Halloween. It probably just wouldn't fly with the audience expectation out there. And so he did what he felt he had to do, which was hypodermic needles in people's eyes and stuff like that, that just, I hated it. I just couldn't stand it. And so I very reluctantly said, you, you guys better find somebody else. I can't, I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. It was sort of heartbreaking for me because what a great opportunity. But I also knew that I couldn't start my directing career on a movie I, on a movie script I hated because it wouldn't it wouldn't come out good. I, if the director's not really gung ho about it, it's going to show. I knew that, and I also knew secondarily that John and Deborah deserved somebody in the director's chair who was really going to do it for them, and not do it reluctantly or fake it, but be genuine. They deserved that, and I wasn't that guy. So it was an awful decision to have to make, but I, I did that, and I'm glad I did, because uh, I, I still, I saw Halloween 2 once, and I hated the movie as much as I hated the script. Looks like they're retconning it now with the new one, so. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Just pure madness. Do you have any feelings about the new film? Nick Castle tells me that the people involved are good people and they're they're real big fans of the originals. And uh, I, I wish them well. I, I don't have any terribly consuming interest in it or uh, curiosity, really. People seem surprised when, uh, oh, you know, they remade The Fog, for example. Right. I never watched it. I, I just wasn't that curious. <laughs> Uh, you're not missing anything. You, you don't. You, you, well, you're that's what I mean. I, this 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 sequel madness. Let's understand where this is coming from. These people aren't getting out there and doing this because they want to make a great piece of art. Somebody sees a way that they're going to make some money. Well, okay, fine, more power to them. But I don't have to. I don't have to get involved or, or get excited about it unless I'm going to make some money out of it. So <laughs> just I try to be honest without being unkind to anyone. My my best wishes go out to the new Halloween people, but I don't I don't really care that much either way.
so if you would have had the chance to rewrite Halloween 2, if John would have been like, all right, you don't like it, what would you do differently? I would have handed him a script that would have looked very much like H2O. Cut to like three years after the event, and now Laurie Strode is on a college campus and trying to normalize her life after such a trauma. And the story kind of tells it. So just look at the how H2O played out. It, it would be like that, sort of trapped on a college campus. I would have preferred that vastly. So you still would have done a traditional sequel in that sense, but you would have done something completely different then. Yeah. The five minutes later sequel, to me, just set John up for a, a, an unwinnable situation where he had to do blood and guts and gore just to get through it. And uh, he did, you have to say, he did a good job because the movie went out and was really successful. So, you know, all, all respect to John for solving the problem in a, a way. But I think he himself fairly recently, I was reading in, uh, there's a magazine called Written By, it's put out by the Writers Guild. He says in that that uh, that was the day he sold out and he felt lousy about it. So, obviously, you stepped away from Halloween 2. It didn't take long, I'm sure, when they had announced they were going to make Halloween 3 after the second film was a success. But things had changed. How exactly did you come on to Halloween 3? What was your first interaction with the whole whole idea of a third film? Well, by this point, I had gone off on my own and was getting other gigs. It was, I had already <laughs> pretty much gotten pigeonholed, and so the calls I was getting was for scary material. Yeah. It wasn't getting much love for uh, a Western or a detective show or a love story or a comedy or anything like that, which is what I would, you know, I was trying for. But I think in order to, to change the course of one's career in the early days, once you've been part of a big success in one genre you really you have to be rich if if you're trying to feed your family you can't afford to say no that many times so you you need to take what comes and uh, i was in new york writing the uh, prequel to the amityville horror called amityville the possession for dino de Laurentiis. when deborah called me kind of out of the blue and said hey would you consider directing halloween 3 i went what huh uh, it's going to be all new. We don't. We're, we're not going to do the shape, and we're not going to do the big knife, and we're not going to do Jamie Lee or Donald Pleasance. It's all new, all new, all different. I believe her her pitch, her one sentence pitch was uh, uh, ancient. The ancient rites of Halloween meet the computer age, or something like that. And I said, "Wow, that sounds really interesting." Uh, so yeah, and I believe by this point they'd already they'd had a, they'd gone around I think for a little while with Joe Dante uh, was on board, if I'm not mistaken. Might have been other people too, but in any event, I think Joe dropped out, had another gig of some sort, and uh, they turned to me. I was really gratified about that because these are old friends, and I had from. From a certain angle, you could say I had let them down by saying no to Halloween 2. And in Hollywood, that often means that those people, once you've said no, those people won't return your phone calls. But of course, these were genuine friends, and we'd gone back a long way. In any event, I was really gratified that they had thought of me, and so I jumped at the chance. So basically then, you, you hear the idea, it's not going to be Michael Myers, it's not going to be the same old thing, it's not even going to be your typical, you know, boogeyman slasher type film. You actually get the, the chance to make what is a fantasy horror film, basically, that just happens to take place on Halloween night. Well, it, one thing that became clear to me as we went along was that uh, two of the several kinds of horror movies you can get involved in are knife movies and pod movies pod referring to invasion of the body snatchers and this was very definitely not a knife movie it was a pod movie and that that excited me even more because invasion of the body snatchers is probably my all-time favorite horror movie certainly and maybe my all-time favorite movie period 
so I was uh, gung ho excited, and I could do on this movie what I couldn't have done on Halloween Two. I the, I could give John and Deborah a director who was really in there and excited and going to fight for the best possible movie we could have. At first, the reception was not necessarily the warmest, I would say. <laughs> well, you know, Tom, it should have not been called Halloween 3. Sure. That was our big mistake. It should have gone out as Season of the Witch. And I think had it done so, it would have done fine. Because right. it, it, has, it has proven since to, to all eyes who really care that it's a good, solid movie. It's fun. And it is truly about the season of Halloween in a way that the actual movie Halloween and all its many sequels is not. Uh, the original Halloween was called, its, a, its first title was The Babysitter Murders. Mm -hmm. And it, it's more about that than Halloween the season. I think the reason my movie is has proven to be popular eternally popular is because it's so much about Halloween itself. You know, it's it's right in that wheelhouse and people keep discovering it and I, I go to these festivals and people say, oh, we watch this every Halloween. You know, it's like, cool. I'll be uh, honest, it so, was actually you know, the first Halloween movie I saw. I did not see uh, the first well, time. Oh, you were a good virgin audience exactly. for it. Exactly, and I, that had, didn't matter to me. I was not that old and it was the perfect way to get me into it so i've always been a fan and like you said and i was going to get around to is it has grown quite the fan base and as you said if it was released just as season of the witch i don't think we'd be having you know the whole conversation we just had but also do you think it would have done better if it had been halloween 2 instead of halloween 3 if they had started right off the bat with doing a completely different uh, halloween probably story? it could have been okay except that we and by we i mean John and Deborah and me uh, were pretty naive about uh, putting it out there without setting the table for the audience. The audience needed to hear what, what we had on our minds in no uncertain terms. This is going to be different. This is something new. We're starting something here, and every year we're going to come out with a new story about the season. Mm -hmm. So fasten your seatbelts and enjoy and we may one day revisit the legend of Michael Myers, if you will. But right now we're doing this. We didn't do any of that. It, the, and I don't think Universal got the movie or liked the movie particularly. And so they let it twist in the breeze. If you look at the original ads for Halloween 3, right up in the corner, all it says, it's a little banner that says, all new. Like, well, right. what's that mean? That's all they did to try and set the table. And, of course, the audience goes in, and they're looking for Michael Myers, and they're looking for the shape, and they're looking for the big knife, and they're looking for Jamie and Curtis. And it's like, what? Nip off. This is, this is no good. It was, it was horrible and heartbreaking. It was crushing. I just I couldn't believe it. What a, what a lousy way to to start a directing career. Redemption has been sweet over the years. It, it People come up now and say, listen, I don't care what anybody says, this is my favorite movie. And I go, thank you, but you don't have to defend it anymore. It's finally <laughs> found its audience. Even though it's campy at times and it's crazy and it's out there, you're right, it really does capture this holiday much better than the first two films did it's one i never miss no matter what i may not watch all 10 of the other ones but <laughs> no I, I love what dan o'hurley he did with that that sort of uh lecture on halloween when when tommy atkins character is sitting there tied up <laughs> and dan is kind of going halloween here's what it's really all about yeah, just like, oh yeah, man. Oh yeah, tell me, uh, tell me more. This, uh, this actually, this festival comes from somewhere, and it's about unleashing evil, or at least observing the dead who can walk for one day. Uh, in the tradition of Dia de los Muertos, there's something behind it, and it uh, it alludes to that, and I think that's really fun because somebody like the evil genius toy maker Connell Cochran 
why he doesn't look upon what he's doing as evil. He's, it's time again. It's time for a human sacrifice of thousands, maybe millions of children. For him, it's like a shrug of the shoulders. Hey, that's that's what has to be now. Kind of like Avengers with uh, Thanos and bringing balance to the galaxy. I don't know if you've seen that or not, but that's kind of his whole goal too. Is he's he's an understandable villain. You know what he's after. So it's like exactly. So it it makes him that much scarier. It's mm-hmm. like, oh my God, how how do you combat this? It's really scary. I feel like you guys probably would have rather done something like Halloween 3, and it's just sad that that didn't work out because things could have been a lot different, and now this new one coming out could have been the return to Michael Myers after, you know, <laughs> this many years. And Yeah, it blows my mind that somebody, presumably somebody like Mustafa Akkad or his son Malik now, didn't sweep in and continue this idea because the idea of a, of a yearly anthology on the subject of Halloween is a gold mine. There are so many great stories you could tell about the season, and it just got dropped. It's like it had cooties on it because Halloween 3 didn't make any money. And so everybody backed away when that is a great money-making idea that could just go on forever. It's like the anthology, the true anthology. You just, it, audiences everywhere be expecting some cool new story every year. Not your Twilight Zone model, you know. Exactly, yep. We began to, I began to just sort of on the fringes of it all, try and start imagining new, new Halloween stories. And it's, it's a fun hobby. I mean, you can just come up with lots of of possibilities. So if you would have got to do a Halloween four in the same vein as three, where do you think you would have went with it? God, uh, I never did settle on, you know, I'm not sitting there with one pulsing, brilliant idea. Uh, but just, it's an interesting subject when you think about what's going on and and how the phenomenon of this idea that was so much celebrated in the U.S., but not so much other places. When you start getting into Day of the Dead and uh, the idea of, on this day, the uh, corridor between the world of the dead and the world of the living is opened up, gosh that could go anywhere it kind of gets into zombies and all the rest so when you came Mm -hmm. on board you uh, the script was already written um famously people like toby hooper were attached to it and at one point it was meant to be much much longer correct uh yes it there was an attrition involved as as the project wore on before i appeared i know it It was more ambitious and longer form. And frankly, I think basically just a lot of the money got spent by the time it got to me. It was a two-night miniseries. And uh, the first night of the two uh, was a brilliant script by Larry Cohen. And that was what got me excited and pulled in. I had not read the novel by the time the project came along. And uh, so Larry's script really hit me right between the eyes. I just thought it was excellent. And, of course, you can imagine as soon as I got the gig, I I jumped into Stephen King's novel, Full Scale. And uh, a a pretty wonderful novel, too. Right, because at that time, outside of maybe The Stand and uh, a few other ones, that was one of the more anticipated ones and also one that everybody thought was basically unfilmable. Like, there was probably no way well, anybody was ever going to be able to do it justice anyway. <laughs> well, they were right about that. It, it, uh, I have not seen the new one. I do know they wisely uh, basically broke it into two parts, and they've, they've only done the first part so far. But it's a big, big story, and a lot of it, uh, I'm sure you're a fan of the book, a lot of it is... Uh, pretty tricky stuff that says metaphysical and a battle in sort of inner space or outer space with a giant turtle symbolizing God knows what. But yes, hard hard to pin that stuff down. I think that uh, Larry and Stephen had recognized the vastness of the book versus the two-night miniseries and had elected to really abbreviate the book into an ending, a second half 
that to me was almost unrecognizable as adaptations go. The, the first night was really recognizable from the book and in a beautiful twist of serendipity. The book has seven characters and conventional TV, a night of television, has seven acts. And so that just, that was, I don't know if that'll ever happen again that cleanly, but that was perfect for television. Uh, whereas the second night, uh, I, I'm not sure what they were thinking, except that they accepted that the book as written was going to be unfilmable, and therefore they could do just a... I found it a very disappointing. After the, the high of reading the first night's script, I, I found the second night to be very prosaic and ordinary and almost predictable. And so I set about the task of bringing the second night up to the standard Larry himself had set with night number one. Mm -hmm. Well, and it needs to be said that uh, the way that the script was written and what you had there to work with, especially considering the limitations of being on television, you know, let mm -hmm. alone not just the metaphysical and the special effects, but the fact that you can't really dive into, like you said, a lot of the subject matter, the, the mm -hmm. violence, the gore, the language, all that. You're also limited by that, let alone the other parts. I think you guys did a really great job of, like you said, especially in the first part, bringing it together. And I think they actually, well, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. The new one is almost a complete remake <laughs> of what you did more oh, so really? than, than what's in the book. The only thing is, is that's very noticeable, is they tried to avoid <laughs> a lot of things that you guys did so as not yeah. to be called copycats and in the process they lose a lot of the, the the storytelling the characters aren't nearly as fleshed out as well as they are in your version and in my eyes and I, I, I'm sure a few out there it is a little bit I'd say your version is actually a little bit more than a lot it's a lot better than the new one but uh, I know a lot of people like well the new thank one as well, you so. I, I, I think the secret of Stephen King uh, which people just tend to forget is not so much the scare power that I, guess, I suppose that's inherent and he's certainly good at that the eeriness and the gore and the scariness and the these awful ideas brought to life okay fine but that's i don't think that's the secret of stephen king i think what he is a master at is a character and especially the characters of children and the rites of passage of childhood. He does it again and again. He did it in The Body, which uh, turned into Stand By Me. He certainly did it in It, and you can see it again and again. And that's really what I focused on, was making sure we got the casting right, especially for the children, and that we told their stories in a meaningful way. Uh, the rest, uh, you know, you can do what you do be the best you can with the budget you've got where things like special effects and stunts and all that are concerned. The part I knew we could shine on, truly shine on, were the characterizations because they're so rich and good and knowing that I don't think uh, Stephen King gets enough credit for for that part of things. It's all these rites of passage and beautiful little secrets that we can all relate to. And the silly things we did as children that were so meaningful. Right. Uh, that's, that's everything in a Stephen King story. What was the choices that were involved leading up through, obviously, Tim Curry as Pennywise? What really kind of motivated you as far as picking those people particularly? Because a lot of them went on to be either bigger actors or at the time were well-regarded television and film actors. Oh, it was it was two distinct kinds of casting. Uh, the grown-ups, we were doing TV star casting. And the children, we were doing pretty much unknowns uh, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, we started with the grown-ups, and this is what I would call telephone casting for the most part, because when you've got known quantities, John Ritter, for example, or Annette O'Toole, uh, or we just go down the list, when you've got those kind of people, you're not going to have a conventional casting session. And in this case, uh, those people had recent credits that you could look at so it wasn't an issue of, oh, uh, is so-and-so overweight or are they still, do they look horrible? It wasn't like that. All of these people were current. They were doing stuff. So 
So a lot of the adult casting was simply, how about Annette O'Toole? Great, I love Annette O'Toole. Okay, well, if the agent, if the deal can be made, we're done with that right there, without even meeting. Right, because, because you just know, you, you just know. It's like, okay, yes, let's just do that. And then after uh, the adult parts were cast, you know, I, I got them all together for just a general, uh, it wasn't even rehearsal time yet, but I just wanted to get everybody together because in, in many cases, I hadn't even spoken with them before they were cast. It was that secure, you know, John Ritter has been, hell yes, of course. Let's do that. And then catch up a little later and have a friendly conversation. But I had no doubt that all of that would work out. Matter of fact, I was a little intimidated because those are some heavyweight people. And I thought, God, these guys could have me for lunch if they want to. I'd better really be on on my toes. Whereas the child casting represented the challenge of casting people who were believable as, oh, does... Jonathan Brandis grow up to be Richard Thomas? Yeah, I believe that. And after we did all of that sort of look-alike casting, is it logical, does this look like this guy? You know, th- those kinds of, of issues. Uh, we, f- we, we sealed the deal by having a, uh, uh, a big pr- rehearsal period that had to do with the kind of a boot camp of the adult characters and the kid characters getting together and working out certain mannerisms that they could share. The way Richard Thomas puts his hand up to his face, Jonathan Brandison, he, with my input, worked that out so that you further seal the deal as, oh, you know, these characters do it this way or Stan had a certain kind of mannerisms the stand the kid character stand the boy scout you know and all of that stuff really really paid off i thought that they were very convincing you know this kid grew up to be this adult it it felt seamless to me the way you told the story was differently in a sense that you had the adults bouncing back and forth. The newer film just starts with the kids. We don't get to see the adult part yet until the second. Part. Oh, so so we don't yet know no. what the adults are going to look like. I suppose that gives them a little more leeway, but it does create a bigger problem than we had. The problem all along is very natural in the story. As these people grow into adults, there is just absolutely some of the magic drops away and, and it's inherent the, the children's story is just because of childhood is a, a bit more interesting than the adults uh, the adult story is a repeat experience they go through it as adults I simply as a spectator I don't care as much they're grown ups it's inherently less riveting and 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 I think they've compounded it because they haven't bothered to introduce, if that's what you say is so, they haven't bothered to introduce the adults and get you accustomed to them already. So they're going to come out and try to capture the magic. It sounds like they've created a problem for themselves. But who knows? I, I, I wish them luck. It's a hard, it's a hard nut to crack. I wonder, deeply wonder if they're going to... Uh, tackle any of the sort of metaphysical space turtle stuff it's hard that would be hard i still can't think how i would have handled it you know you know if i had all the money in the world and all the time i still can't think how i would have handled it yeah i mean there's references to turtles so that's a possibility they're setting it up but uh, they are also bringing the young cast back to shoot scenes for the second film they're going to sit there and have the issue like you didn't have filming and that's why i wondered why they just didn't film both parts back to back because now the kids are all going to be a year better older (laughs) it's probably going to be noticeable that's tricky yeah. That's tricky because man, kids change fast. Exactly. Yes. yes. Like th- these adorable child actors. It <laughs> happened on the Waltons, for example. These, right. these adorable child actors, and like one year later, they're kind of ugly looking, and they have pimples and stuff. And it's like, oops. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, obviously, it was inspired casting to have Tim Curry play the part. It, 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 the first time someone mentioned his name, I felt like it was the right choice. Uh, 
it, like like the other grown up parts, this was star casting. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, "How you feel about Tim Curry?" I said, "Are you kidding me? <laughs> he would be brilliant in this part." And to me, the conversation ended there. If we could get Tim Curry, that job is done. Did you have uh, anybody else bel- in mind before that at all? Or oh, yeah, you know, in mind perhaps, but no serious conversations about other people. I believe in previous iterations people had talked about malcolm mcdowell Mm -hmm. or roddy mcdowell for that matter those really never came up as serious possibilities in my mind it was it was pretty much always tim yeah i think tim captured it perfectly even better than the newer version because he had that uh likability at the same time he could switch from being lovable and funny to scary I've noticed in the posters and the advertising, and I do have the movie. I, it's, I'm, I'm not boycotting it or anything. I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, I, it the, the clown, Pennywise, in the new version, just in pictures, looks scary to me. What on earth? What child would approach exactly. this creep? Whereas Tim looks cool. He looks like a clown. It's like, oh, neat. Yeah, I'll have a balloon from you or yeah, I'll you pick a piece of candy from you. You're a nice clown. The, the new clown, it's like, fuck, run as fast as you can. Exactly. <laughs> this guy is is evil. You can see it. They, so I, I felt like they, they kind of shot themselves in the foot in a way. I am sure the, uh, was it Peter Skarsgård? Yes. I am sure he does a great job, and uh, I am sure that the scary parts are really scary, but how could you... I feel like that's a mistake walking in the door to make him that evil-looking. As an adult, you're watching and you're going, oh, God, don't, don't be fooled. This, you know, this thing is evil. But a kid, you have to, you have to believe that the kids are being fooled. That's crucial. And I think that the, in our day and time, where horror movies are concerned, there has been such an arms race for scary and gory and violent that uh, writers and directors are under such pressure to be be scary. It's got to be scary. Yeah, it's more about the shock and it's like, value, yeah. just just fucking back off of this shit. It really really annoys me that the, there's such insecurity involved with filmmaking about scary subjects. Scary subjects come about when you least expect it, which means that your touch in, in places may need to be as light as a musical or a comedy in order to deliver the punch, in order to deliver the goods. Uh, I think a lot of filmmakers make the mistake of thinking it, that it has to just constantly be relentlessly suspenseful and rough and tough and, and everybody's uh, hyper-violent and hyper Grimacing, you know, ground guignol. I just it it's like so missing the point. I think a lot of directors have have confused gore with scare, and the two are vastly different. And I could I I would put the blame for that on movies like Saw, mm-hmm. which you know it came in and proved to be popular. They found a real audience, but what they were selling wasn't scare at all. It was torture porn. And that's okay if that's what you want. You buy your ticket and you get what you want. But it, it, to me, that's not scary. It can make you uneasy because I think that's real. I think there are real screwed up characters out there doing stuff like that. But if the assignment is to make a scary movie, uh, there are other ways to go about it that might be more effective. I, I come out of the John Carpenter school and uh, I think I think John had a lot to offer in that regard, and most of it just had to do with keep it simple, don't forget your sense of humor. It, it doesn't have to be expensive or or uh, crazy special effects in order to be scary. Scary is deeply human and basic and almost animal in the chords you can play to touch an audience. Tom, you. you it's really, it's like a piece of music. Uh, the dynamics of making a good, scary movie are no different than the dynamics of making a comedy. In a comedy, you've got to establish a sense of goodwill 
And then you got to deliver laughs. And it's just punctuated. The expectation of humor needs to always be around the atmosphere of willingness to have fun and, and see funny and to smile, all that. It just translates equally into horror movies. You have to establish an air of tension, expectation, dread, fear, and then you have to deliver the goods. And sometimes it's about shock and sometimes it's about suspense. But it's playing with an audience and taking them on a roller coaster ride. And I think people just forget because the stakes are high and it just it gets ridiculous. Oh, yeah. So you did kind of bring up some challenges of adapting the film, and especially in the second half. We've talked a little bit about Turtle and stuff like that, things you didn't really get to get into. Was there anything else offhand that you could think of that you wish you would have been able to get into the miniseries from the book that you didn't? No, really, quite the opposite, Tom. It's a big book. It's crazy long and rambling. I feel like the nature of the problem, the nature of the assignment, was to do the Reader's Digest version, which is, okay, strip this thing away until you've got pure plot. This is what happened. These kids discover there's a monster in Derry, and now they've got to go about protecting themselves, and as naive kids might do, brave and crazy, they're going to kill it. That's a great, great story. You can leave a lot of other stuff out as long as you tell that story. Yeah, you guys really did break and, it down to its simplicity, for sure, yeah. Yeah, and, and you got you have to. It's a, that's You're limited in page count. How many pages can you cram into this story? Well, you, you can't go too far overboard or it'll just get cut out in the editing room because there's no... You're within a time right. stricture. You don't, have, you don't have even two minutes to play with. If it was a feature film... You could actually have yeah. a little more leeway, but yeah, I totally get what you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely, and it works on film and just as well on its own without the book, and because you left out a lot of stuff you don't need, and that's the whole point. And I, exactly, it, it, it. Stephen King wrote a book that that rambles like crazy, but and it's part of his talent that you know you never lose interest. Everything is interesting, but there are a million side ventures and sort of, I suppose the uh, set piece that I would have enjoyed tackling that uh, we did just really didn't have a place for was that sequence where I guess it's Henry Bowers or one of his, maybe it's one of his minions, sidekicks, uh, in the woods with the refrigerator and these sort of creatures that... Uh, come out of the refrigerator and devour him or so I can't even quite remember how it worked but it was it was exciting and scary and grisly and completely strange I would have enjoyed tackling that there are plenty of places in the book though that I think the editing job made it stronger I wouldn't have considered for a minute following the book in the uh, the part where each one of the boys has sex with Beverly after they've gone through this mind-boggling experience. I think Stephen King missed the boat there. I yeah. think that was just incorrect. In some better. ways, it got in the way of everything else that they were up to. It just seemed like a kind of adolescent fantasy that was just... I, I just didn't get it. I didn't understand what that was doing in the story. Mm -hmm. I'm not sorry I left that out. Right. But yeah, the response to it, from what I recall, was actually pretty big, was it not? I mean, I thought it was one of the better uh, responses oh, to it was, Stephen King television uh, movies. It it was the most successful miniseries, uh, ratings-wise, of that year. And, and its competitor, the miniseries that knocked it off the block, was another one I did, which wasn't horror at all. It was a... a a crime drama called And the Sea Will Tell, but we were right up there in ratings on both counts. The, yeah. Like you said, the ratings were huge, and it it had a longevity like nobody's business because it's been re-released on video probably more times than any television movie in history, I'm willing to bet. Yeah, so it, so it seems, and uh, I'm grateful for that. It, uh, it has touched a lot of people. I, I go to some of these cons, you know, the uh, horror weekends, that where fans come and 
meet and greet and, and stuff. And uh, it really, really, I, I understood that for its generation, it really touched a lot of young people. Mm-hmm. But it seems to keep going. Uh, that uh, Like Halloween, it just seems to keep accumulating fans. It was no real surprise to you then when the new movie took off like it did, because it almost seemed like Warner Brothers, again, like ABC did back in the day, kind of got cold feet and weren't sure if this was going to work, and I think it took everybody by surprise in the box office. I I felt at the time, and some people have been asking me for years and years, because remember, it is one of those movies that was getting remade for the last 15 or 20 years, and people would ask me, what do you think about the new It? And I'd say, what new It, you know? I keep hearing rumors, but they they don't do it. And I always said the same thing. If they get the clown right, and if they get the kids right, they'll be fine. Don't worry about all the rest. Is there any projects that you wish you would have taken that you got offered that you didn't in the past? Oh, you know, there was a certain point when I had an opportunity to do a film in China that would have taken me probably about a year away and this was at a point where my kids were just you know they were at very tender ages although by that point nancy and i had split up and we were dividing custody of the kids so i was already a not a 24 7 kind of dad i felt like that was just too much it's like okay people make these decisions all the time in hollywood between career and family and some people go for family and some people go for career. For me, it was never a serious question. It was going to have to be, I need to stay here so I can be a little closer to my kids and take care of them as best I can when <laughs> when it's my turn and not go to China for a year. That just sounded like it was too much. Well, I still look back and wonder what that experience would have been like, but I've had some, I've had some really fun interesting experiences you know in russia and england and uh, tahiti and hawaii and uh, many times in vancouver uh, and other places so no regrets so you regret the places you didn't get to go so much more than the projects themselves there are a couple of titles i could quote to you but i'm not going to it i don't uh you know i i look at a certain movie that went out there and was a blockbuster and could have who knows and it went to a certain guy who went on to have uh, a lot more hits it was mine for the taking and uh there was one i didn't care much for the script so what can you say right. uh i had a chance to work with tom hanks very early in his career and I just confess, I didn't see it. I didn't, I didn't see what he had that made him so special. And I pushed for a different actor, and that project eventually fell through. But, you know, the, the, the town is full of those stories. Oh, yeah. Is there any projects that you're working on right now that you want to talk about real quick? Oh, Tom, let me let me let me fill you in because I I'm slowing down and getting older, but I don't feel like that I'm necessarily finished. And uh, my son and I are working on several things, and I've written a uh, novella as well. So, just briefly, what's on the table right now is one that used to be called Helliversity is now being called The Gate. And speaking of H2O, it bears a certain resemblance to this idea of uh, a college campus with a big wall around it. It can be a safe haven, but it could also be turned into a a prison in a way. And so a night of terror in the Deep South, uh, that's the gate. And then uh, we're working on a nice script right now about a, a group of of high school students who do a haunted house project for a fundraiser and things go terribly wrong. That's called Scary Land and we're looking for financing for that one. We've got a TV series that um, have high hopes for. It's about basically (laughs) the apocalypse in Los Angeles when all the elements conspire, the earthquake and the mudslides and the fires and even a, a 
suitcase nuke in John Wayne Airport conspire to make L.A. a very nasty place. This is a dark comedy in a motel on the edge of town. That one's called Midnight Motel. Last but not least is by Novella, which is called One Christmas Eve, which is not scary, but is kind of heartwarming, uh, about a grizzled old street guy and a young man, cynical young man, who is uh, getting a divorce and who is just miserable on a certain Christmas Eve when they get together and stay up all night. Well, we look forward to those projects as they come out. And, of course, we want to thank you, Mr. Wallace, for taking the time to talk to us here at Midnight's Edge. It's been very insightful, and hopefully we'll get to talk to you again sometime real soon. Well, thank you, Tom. I've enjoyed it, and uh, best of luck to you. And, of course, I want to thank you guys for listening to this interview with Tommy Lee Wallace. I'm Tom Connors for Midnight's Edge. If you like this video, then please click the subscribe button. And don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified for all the latest uploaded content. Due to recent changes to YouTube's monetization policies, we'd also like to ask you to please consider supporting Midnight's Edge and its sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark through Patreon. As thanks for their support, patrons will receive early notifications of mini-documentaries, special behind-the-scenes Making of the Edge videos, bloopers, outtakes, lost episodes, and more. You can support the channel for as little as $1 a month. Be sure to check back for news and analysis on the corporate politics behind your favorite genre movies, as well as updates and discussion here at Midnight's Edge.